Hey there, for example 3.2, we are going to look at a binomial random variable. Scenario is this, we're going to take three coins, we're going to flip them eight times each, and the problem tells us what we're interested in. So in this problem, we're interested in the number of times all three coins land on the same face. Now remember from unit two, a random variable is a number that you are interested in tracking. And depending on how you define it, the possible values are dependent on that definition. So for this problem here, we're gonna count how many times that all three coins land on the same face. So that is my random variable because I know the problem tells me right here what we're interested in. So let me just use any arbitrary letter. X seems to be the popular one here as number of times all three coins land on the same face. Okay, so that's the number I'm counting. Now, if you want, sometimes it's helpful just to identify what are the possible values. Well, if I'm flipping all three coins eight times, I potentially have a maximum of eight times where they all match or a minimum of zero. So it'd be all the integers from zero to eight. Okay, so not a whole lot of choices. Now, when the instructions ask for what is the distribution of your random variable or state the distribution right here, then it's asking you to model this random variable after a well-defined model. And to date in PSAT 5A, you've only learned one, and that's the binomial. So the intention of the question is to make sure that you understand the binomial criteria. So let's make a list here of our four binomial criteria. So we've got the first one, and they're in no particular order, but generally they are written this way. We have a fixed number of trials. Now what that means is you are repeating the same yes-no type of experiment um, a fixed number of times. So in this example, we are completing the coin flips eight times. So I'm gonna go ahead at the same time and highlight what our condition is. So we have N, which is our number of trials is equal to eight. Another criteria is that we have two outcomes and that's where this prefix by comes from the binomial. And the outcomes are defined as the success and failure, where it has nothing to do with good and bad outcomes. The success is just the outcome you're interested in counting. And so since I'm counting how many times they all match, I want to make sure that I define that as my, quote, success. So the two outcomes would be they either all match, meaning they all land on the same face, or they don't all match. And then a third condition is that of independence, which is generally assumed as long as it makes sense. So from trial to trial, is there any type of dependency between them? Otherwise, it's safe for you to assume they're independent. So for this example, since we are repeatedly flipping coins, there's no reason to think why coin flips would influence subsequent outcomes. So here, I'm gonna say that I'm assuming independence. And then finally, the last one is that you have a fixed probability of success. So the probability of getting your success, the notation is a lowercase p, and this is constant. And for this particular example, we could figure it out because we know that the success is where all three coins land on the same face. So that means there are only two outcomes. There's that outcome where they're all heads or this outcome where they're all tails. So that means for us, the probability is two successes out of your eight total outcomes. And that's from flipping three coins. And if I wanna simplify this as just 0.25. So finally, the notation that we're going to use to illustrate what the distribution is, is that we use our letter, 
we draw this little tilde, the notation that tells us it behaves after a well-defined distribution. And then generally it's gonna be the abbreviation. And now I'll highlight the parameters that uniquely define this problem here. N is eight, and then we calculate P is 0.25. And that is the distribution. For the second part of this problem, now that we've identified the type of random variable, and again, you see from the first part, that's here. We can now go through and calculate three different things regarding random variables that we learned from chapter two. One is, well, what's the likelihood the random variable is in a certain range or a specific number? Those are probabilities. In addition, you could calculate an expectation or an average. And then finally, the third calculation for random variables in PSAT 5A will be finding out what's the variance or standard deviation. And those calculations capture the spread surrounding the average. So this first part here, we're just gonna calculate some probability. So what I'll highlight is going to be your probability definition for binomials. So what we have is if, you have a binomial, then instead of drawing tree diagrams, listing sample spaces, we have a formula that can calculate any probability K that we're interested in. And so by simply plugging values into this formula, we could calculate all of our probabilities. So for the first example here, I want, well, what's the probability x is two? So if I look at this equation, let's make this actually look correct. Probability x is two. So in terms of my formula, that means that k equals two. I already know the values of N and P from our definition earlier. And so now I'm just gonna plug this in. This will end up being eight, choose two, P raised to the K power and then one minus P, which again, we know is 0.25 raised to the n minus k exponent. And then from here, I can simply just shove it all into a calculator, but I can also simplify. And so let's work through that. So eight choose two will look like this. And then I have 0.25 squared. And then one minus 0.25 is 0.75 eight minus two is to the sixth power. And once I get here, I can just simply plug all these values into my calculator, or simplify if you want, but my calculations tell me this probability is three, one, one, five. So now in words that represents, well, what's the chance that when I do this experiment, i.e. when I flip these coins eight times, there's a little over a 31% chance I would get exactly two of those times where they all match. In the second part, it's when what's the chance I get at least one? And so the notation there. Now, if I do this explicitly, it means, well, it could be one, it could be two, just any number in this set. And so this is gonna end up being quite a few calculations. I won't write everything out, but you get the idea here. This would go all the way until I end up at eight. Now, definitely the long way of doing this would be to just plug all of these values into the formula above and do them one by one. But if you recall from unit one, you can sometimes take advantage of counting complements because they'd be faster. So for this problem here, the complement of this set one through eight would just be, well, what's the chance I don't get any? And so what I'm borrowing, and I'll write the rule out again, is this rule below where it says the probability of event A is one minus its complement. And the complement, again, is everything that is not the current event. 
So the current set I want right here is everything one or bigger. Well, the opposite of that is just not getting any. So now, as long as I remember to begin with the one minus, I can now plug these values in where my K is zero. So I've got H zero point twenty five to the zero and then one minus 0.25 to the eight minus zero. And so this will save me a lot of time just by implementing rules I've already learned from previous chapters. In this case, um, um, the complement rule written below in red. And if I plug this into my calculator, I get a pretty high probability, which is pretty intuitive, 0.8999. So in the last part of this binomial example are just using the binomial equations that we have. So the big picture for this problem is identifying that we have a binomial random variable. And that's walking through the four criteria. In the previous example, we saw how to find probabilities of binomials. And now you're asked to find mu and sigma. And if you recall, mu is just the expected value and then sigma is the standard deviation which happens to be the square root of the variance. And in chapter two, we had summation equations for these, but the advantage of chapter three, identifying that you have a special family of random variables called binomial, well, now you have specific equations you can plug in. Namely, the expected value of a binomial is simply n times p. And then the standard deviation of the binomial is going to be the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. All right, and I want to highlight here that these equations that I'm putting this bubble around are only if you know that you are dealing with a binomial random variable. And if it's not binomial, then we'll have to use the more algebra definition of calculating those sums that we saw back in unit two. So for this problem, it will be pretty straightforward since I have my information that's a binomial, I know n, I know p, so now I can just figure out that mu is n times p or eight times 0.25, and that's two. So in words that represents, well, on average, if I were to repeatedly do this experiment, I would expect to see two times where the number of coins all match. And then similarly, the standard deviation is gonna be the square root of n times p, one minus p. And then I can substitute my values, 8.25, one minus 0.25, and then the square root of all of that ends up being 1.225. And that's going to represent a measure of how spread out these random variables are. That concludes the first binomial example in 3.2.